Before we begin, I'd like to request uh, everybody to put their phones on silent or put them away, turn them off, and uh, don't refer to them during the khutbah. Inshallah, once the khutbah and salah is over, we can get back on your mobile devices, inshallah. Inna alhamdulillah, na'maduhu wa nasta'inu wa nasta'gfiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina. Man yahdihillahu ta'ala fala mudillalah, wa man yudlil fala hadiyalah. وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما فإن أصدق الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters and my respected elders The topic of today's khutbah is going to be deriving lessons from the blessed life of an individual that we are all familiar with an individual whose life is so incredible, so fascinating, that it makes him one of the, in fact, the best human being to ever walk the face of the earth. And that individual is none other than our beloved Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it is always necessary to talk about some of these incidents because we as believers need to rekindle our love for the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Especially when we know that loving him, respecting him, honoring him, defending him is part of our faith, part of our Iman. And generally speaking, people in wider society cannot comprehend and find it difficult to <coughs> understand what is so special about this person that Muslims love him so much. So I want to share with you just a few incidents from his life, starting with the attitude that his followers had towards him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And who better to illustrate this to us than the foremost companion, the best friend of the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. Much can be said, and this is a topic that can take from us hours and hours and days and days of lectures and discussions. So I'll try to summarize as much as I can. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, according to some historian uh, accounts, they say that Abu Bakr became the friend of the Rasul, peace be upon him, at the age of 10. So as young as 10 years old, he was already the friend of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When the Prophet, peace be upon him, got his nubuwa at the age of 40, Abu Bakr was already his friend for three decades prior to that. And many years later, during an argument that Abu Bakr would have with the companion Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself would mention a quality of Abu Bakr that only the Rasul was able to say, and nobody else could have expressed it, expressed it as eloquently as the Rasul Sallallahu And this, by the way, illustrates to us that these companions were human beings. They had their own mistakes, they had their own problems with each other, they had their own misunderstandings because they were mortals, they were fallible, they were not infallible, they were human beings. So the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at that incident, during the time of this argument with, between Umar and Abu Bakr, the Rasul peace be upon him would say that every single one of you, when I presented you with the message, with this deen, with this tawheed, with this iman, every single one of you hesitated. Every single one of you required some time to think over it. You required to sleep over it, to consider it. 
But when I presented it to Abu Bakr, he immediately embraced it. And scholars mention why was this the case? Because Abu Bakr was already ready for the message. He was already contemplating life. And therefore, it's no coincidence that just as we know that the Rasul, peace be upon him, before becoming a prophet, was well known in his society for his honesty, trustworthiness, for his sweet demeanor, for his patience, for his gentleness, for his softness, and the praises can go on and on and on. So too was Abu Bakr Siddiq. He was known as a man of respect. He was known as a man of dignity. So Abu Bakr anhu was already contemplating, is there more to life than just me eating, drinking, enjoying myself, sleeping, and the next day repeat? Is this what life is all about? Or is there more to life than this? And so when the message was presented, Abu Bakr accepted. Now you all know that in Mecca, it was a very hostile environment, that the Muslims had to hide their identity. And a companion by the name of Arqam ibn Abil Arqam donated his house to the cause of the Muslims. And he said that you Muslims can come to this house, can congregate here, can pray, can learn. Teaching and learning can take place. My house is at your disposal because Muslims have to live their faith in secrecy. But very soon, the house of Arqam ibn Abil Arqam, known as Darul Arqam, reached capacity. And so Abu Bakr al-Siddiq said to the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, I believe it's time for us to take the message public. And the Prophet said, are you really sure, O Abu Bakr? And he said, yes, let's take the message public. So they all got together. They marched from Darul Arqam to the masjid, to, at that time it wasn't a masjid per se, to the Kaaba, where the mushrikeen and the chieftains would congregate. And each Muslim, companion went with his own tribe because it was a tribal society for protection the prophet takes a seat and abu bakr stands up to give a speech therefore becoming the first spokesperson of the prophet no sooner had abu bakr begun to speak than utbah ibn abi rabia one of the enemies of islam pounced on him and began beating him up mercilessly Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu fell unconscious in a pool of blood, chaos everywhere. They carried him to his house. And it is reported that Abu Bakr was unconscious for more than a day. When he regains consciousness, he asks, the first thing that comes out of his mouth is, how is the Prophet, peace be upon him? And at that time, Abu Bakr's parents are non-Muslim. His mother, his father, Abu Quhafa, they're non-Muslims. And they felt disgusted at this. They said, even now, O oh Abu Bakr, even now, after you've been through so much that your face is disfigured, you've been bloodied up, your bones have been broken, and you're asking the Rasul وسلم, asking about him, how he's doing. Because see, from Abu Bakr's perspective, the last thing he remembers is the Prophet sitting down, him speaking, and bam, he was attacked. So Abu Bakr didn't know how the Prophet was doing. And he said, I swear by Allah, I'm neither going to have a morsel of food nor a sip of water until you take me to Darul Arqam and until I see with my own two eyes that the Prophet is doing okay. And so he was taken. And when he sees the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, only now can I feel at peace. Now this is something that you and I relate to. We understand this. Therefore, it is important for larger society to also understand when you educate them, when you speak to them, that the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam means so much to us. That this is an individual who sacrificed so much for the guidance of not just me and you, but for the guidance of humanity. Therefore, we must never shy away from speaking out, from telling our colleagues at work, our neighbors, whoever it is, that whenever the Rasul, peace be upon him, is insulted, we feel insulted. Whenever the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa is being attacked, he's being slandered, he's being spoken about inappropriately, it really hurts us. And for that matter, not just the Rasul, peace be upon him, but any prophet, whether it's the prophet Moses, whether it's the prophet Jesus, whether it's prophet David, whether it is the Virgin Mary, alayhi peace be upon her, if she is spoken about inappropriately, 
we feel offended. This is something that we must vocalize. This is something that we must live in our own lives. I'll share with you three points, just three points that are simple to, inshallah ta'ala, understand, but profound in their implications on how we should respond whenever we see negativity about our faith, whenever we see negativity about our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Barakallahu minna wa lakum fi al-Qur'an al-Kareem wa nafa'ni wa liyakum bil ayati wa dhikri al-Hakim innahu ta'ala jawadun kareemun malikum barwa. إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله تعالى فهو المهتد ومن يهده فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد وبعد There is no doubt that we are living in a time that is surrounded by godlessness. It takes discipline to be a person of God in a godless world, where values are being shoved down our throats that are antithetical to our faith, to our religion. It is a challenge. It is difficult. So how do we respond? How should a Muslim's reaction be in the face of rising hate? in the face of Islamophobia, in the face of racism and bigotry, how should your and my reaction be? It must be dedicated and dictated rather. It must be dictated by the example of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It must be dictated by the teachings of the Quran or Muslims. We're not a people who should act upon impulse and emotions alone, no. Your and my impulses and our emotions have got to be tempered by a proper understanding of what our faith tells us <coughs> on how to react. Please realize that the slanders and the hate against the Rasul is not something new. This is something that has been happening over the centuries and will continue after you and I have left this earth. And this was something that was happening in the presence of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on his face even. And for that, I want to share with you an incident that is recorded in the Mustadrak of Al-Hakim. In which the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Medina, he once went to a wealthy Jewish businessman. Wealthy Jewish businessman and asked for a loan. And the both of them, the Prophet ﷺ and this individual had agreed to the date on which the loan shall be returned. As time went by, before the due date, this individual comes while the Prophet ﷺ is seated with his companions. And he takes hold of the Prophet's collar and in the most disrespectful manner says to the Rasul that you, O Banu Hashim, you're notorious for never returning things on time. Now notice, this man knows very well his words. This individual knows that what I am going to say is going to be provocative. That if you have a problem with me as an individual, talk to me. Why do you have to drag my tribe and my family and my parents and my mother and my children? You don't need to do that. So this individual very calculatedly is using his words. What was the reaction of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Muslims? The Prophet, peace be upon him, was quiet and Umar عنه, immediately stood up. And you can imagine what his reaction would be. He says, Ya Rasulullah, give me the command, I'll finish this person off. The Rasul, peace be upon him, says to this man, calm down. Who? This Jewish businessman. The Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, calm down. And he reprimands Umar ibn al-Khattab. And he says, oh Umar, instead of you reminding me to pay this man what is due to him, and instead of you to tell this man to calm down, you are ready to become violent? Oh Umar, this is not right. Pay this man what is due to him, and along with this, give him a gift as a token of apology for how you've treated this person. 
In another narration that is muttafaq alayh, that is recorded in both Bukhari and Muslim with an authentic chain, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam tells us, he says that my example and the example of humanity, now notice the Prophet didn't say my example <coughs> and the example of the Muslimin and the examples of the Mu'mineen and the example of the believers, no. My example and the example of humanity is like that of a man who is in a forest at night covered with darkness and kindles a fire. Now notice the example that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is presenting. That here is an individual in the middle of the night, it's darkness, in the forest kindles a fire. The Prophet continues, as the fire becomes bright, the insects and the flies all around are attracted to this source of light. And they're rushing to it, jumping into it, thinking that it is light, but not realizing that they are being burnt alive. It's their destruction. The Rasul said, that is my example. And I am trying to hold on to you, to grab onto you by whatever means possible and necessary. And you are just slipping away from my fingers, my hands, like water slips away. Look at the compassion of the Prophet, peace be upon him. He's saying that I'm trying to grab on to you, hold on to you. Do not rush to your destruction. So the attitude of the Prophet, peace be upon him, was always coming from a place of compassion, O Muslims. From a place of compassion. This is what we've forgotten. So when you see somebody speak evil about you, evil about your faith, evil about your messenger, peace be upon him, take a step back before reacting. Hold on. Assess. Try to see where this person is coming from. Why does this person hate me so much? Why does this person hate my Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa so much? Let me come from a place of compassion. Why? Because I want guidance for this person. Just as the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa wanted guidance for not just the believers, but the humanity as a whole, that may Allah make them believers. That was his hope. That was <coughs> his entire struggle in life for Muslims. So when you see somebody acting or saying evil things on social media or on your face or something, first of all, come from a place of compassion. That's the first point. That let me think about how I can guide this person. Why is this person so misguided? The second point, and time is almost up, the second point is, there will be elements whose job is only to provoke. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran how we must respond to such kind of provocation that is meant to elicit a most vile reaction. And so how should we react? Allah tells us in Surah Fuqan, Surah 24, Ayah number 63, Surah 25, Ayah number 63, وَإِذَا قَالُوا سَلَامًا That whenever the ignoramus Whenever the most ignorant person says the most evil thing to you, something that's so nonsensical and far-fetched in order for you to lose your mind, what should you do? Just say peace and walk off. Walk away from there. You and I don't have to stoop down to their level and engage with them on social media and debate with them for hours and days and weeks and months. What are you doing? Focus at the task at hand. Not things like this and getting bogged down with such people. And the third and final point is to learn from the guidance of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to live his teachings, to hold seminars, symposiums if you can, to talk to people about your Rasul. Pick up a book on the seerah of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Listen to a lecture on your commute, on your drive. Listen to your favorite speaker. YouTube is available at your fingertips. Whatever means necessary, educate yourself about who the Rasul was. And yes, one of the reasons for me to dedicate this khutbah on the life of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa is that this is the month of Rabi al awwal when people generally celebrate something called the Mawlid. And I'm not interested in going down the path of whether it's haram or halal or bid'ah or this and that. All I ask of you is, if you want to celebrate the Mawlid of the Rasul, peace be upon him, and you will be having a gathering, at least in that gathering, pick up a book of Sikha. <coughs> And if not the whole book, talk about incidents from the life of the Prophet and make it a point for yourself and all the people who are gathered with you. 
that this is one quality that we have decided to live our lives by. And when the next Mawlid comes, when the next year comes, let's carry out an assessment. Am I living up to the teachings of my Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or not? Then only, O oh Muslims, will we be deserving of the shafa'ah of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on Judgment Day. Then only will we be deserving of being called true believers in the message of this remarkable individual. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who follow his true teachings. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive our shortcomings. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kindle in our hearts a sincere love for the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah allow us to take and have a glimpse of him on judgment day. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to drink from the hawl, from the pool, with the blessed hands of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and quench our thirsts from his pool. On that day when there will be so much thirst and nothing will quench thirst except for this drink from his pool. Ameen ya Rabbi Kareem. Ibn Allah rahmatullah inna Allah ya amru bil adli wa nyaksan wa ikari bil qurba wa yanha anil fahshai wal munkari wal munkari wal baghi ya ayu wa kutari wa kutari wa kutari wa udhukuru Allah wa dhikru an kathirin wa kutabihum wa dhikru an asila wa la dhikru Allah wa kutari 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 wa